Hello, welcome back to another note for our serology unit. And this is going to be DNA profiling. Uh, you can call this by many names. That'd be DNA testing, DNA typing. Sometimes they call it genetic fingerprinting. But in forensics, we generally refer to it as DNA profiling. Now, hopefully you've reviewed some information about DNA, so you're comfortable with that. And let's see how they do this. First of all, what is it? Just in a general sense, DNA profiling is a technique employed by forensic scientists to assist in identification of individuals using their DNA. But in order to understand how this works, we have to understand a few things about human DNA. First of all, almost all of our DNA is exactly the same. You, me, your mom, your dad, every other person who goes to Milliken, all of our DNA, 99.9% .9 of it is exactly the same. That means that forensic science, when we are going to be looking at whether or not DNA matches from one person to another, we're not actually looking at all of their DNA because most of it is the same anyway. We're going to be looking at the 0.1% of the human genome, which equates to about 3 million nucleotide bases to find variations. Now, the variations in that genetic code, in the 3 million nucleotides that are different, that is going to give you your individual unique DNA profile. And yes, we do see similarities in the variations between siblings, between parents, and that allows us to look at paternity and things like that, but they're not going to be the same. So let's go back again. Hopefully you reviewed DNA a little bit, but let's go and take it one step further. Hopefully you remember what DNA was stood for and that we found it in the cell and that it's usually packaged into these genomes. But when we want to use the DNA, it has to get unraveled and then you're actually using portions of the DNA called a gene, which then will code for a protein. And those genes are going to be the same from person to person to person. The protein here, let's say this is salivary amylase, which is something you have in your saliva. Well, the gene that makes that in you and the gene that makes that in me is identical. And if you happen to have a gene for, let's say, insulin next to it, assuming you are not diabetic, then your gene for insulin is exactly the same as my gene for insulin. So if we were to look at the DNA profiles from these genes, they would be identical for every human. So what are we actually looking for when we do DNA profiling? Where are we finding the variations? So here's where we find it. You need to know a little bit about how our genome works. So we're looking at the picture here and on your DNA strand, you will have a gene. In front of that gene, you'll have a little sequence of DNA, which we call the promoter. It basically is a sequence that tells the RNA polymerase or the DNA polymerase enzyme to come and attach itself to the DNA to start reading it. The gene itself are all of the genes, all of the codes that will then code for a specific enzyme or a profile. And at the end of the gene, there will always be this little stop code on. It's a specific sequence of bases that tell the enzyme, okay, time to stop. Before the next start codon for the next pro, the, before the next promoter sequence for the next gene, there's a little extra DNA in there, which we call non-coding DNA regions. And sometimes they actually call them junk DNA. It is literally spacer DNA that doesn't code for anything. It's extra bases, extra T's, extra G's, extra C's, extra A's that are just filler. They're just there. It is in these sequences that humans have individual variation. So why? 
When your body is making a protein and it's using a gene, if that gene doesn't work, then that cell generally dies because it can't make the protein that it needs. So those don't get passed on because those cells die. When a cell um, duplicates, if the cell makes a mistake when it is reading the DNA to make a copy for the new cell, then the cell actually has a way in order to kind of double check to make sure there's no uh, miss copies. And even if we do miss copy and it goes through, we'll get a mutation and usually that's a harmful mutation and that will probably make that cell die. And occasionally there will be a good mutation. That's how evolution works. We get these small mutations. But there are different mechanisms in the cell to make sure that when those uh, genes, when those base pairs that are within a gene get copied, that it's done correctly. But there is no mechanism to make sure that the base pairs in that junk DNA region are copied correctly. And if they do have a miscopy, it doesn't affect anything because it doesn't code for anything. So changes often crop up in those regions of junk DNA because they don't make any kind of contribution to the health or survival of the organism. So if anything goes wrong in the copying of one to another, when your cells divide, it doesn't matter. So over hundreds and thousands and millions of years, the DNA in there has gotten different and different and different from one person to another and down one uh, lineage to another. So, for instance, your DNA you got from your mom and your dad have those variations that they had, but you're getting a mix and mash of, of your mom and dad. So your DNA obviously is going to be different than theirs because you're mixing the two. And there's so many different of these little regions that even if your parents have a lot of kids, like my mom and dad had a lot of kids, we're all still gonna be different because there's no way that every single one of those little non-coding genes that you got exactly the same combination as another sibling. The DNA profiling that was first discovered and first used uses sequences in that junk D, uh, DNA. They look for repetitive bases and those repetitive bases so let's say in the junk dna we find a section that says a a t t so repetitive base pairs in that junk dna region and we call those vntrs variable number tandem repeats so we're going to look at a specific junk dna between a couple different um, genes and we're going to be looking for repeated sections within there so how do we actually do the profiling? If we're only looking for some variation within that junk DNA, how does this actually work? So there's multiple steps. Let me explain how this goes. The steps all together are called restriction fragment length polymorphism or RFLP. We start with a blood sample or a cheek swab or some other sample of organic material that's gonna hold DNA. We are going to extract DNA from there and we're going to take it through these multiple steps. So here are the steps. Step one, get the DNA out of the cells. We're not going to go through exactly how that works. Just understand that all cells except for red blood cells and hair work for DNA extraction. Body fluids are also commonly used. Semen, blood, saliva, they all work. And in every single case, we add some kind of chemical to it, which will then dissolve the rest of the cell, but leave the DNA by itself. So we have a couple different methods here that I'm showing you on the right. The recover ease method takes about 17 hours. The phenochloroform and ethanol method takes around three days. The, the reality is we're just using some chemicals to break down all the other cellular structure and leave us with just the DNA. Once we have pure DNA, we then need to make copies of it. And your body makes copies of DNA already whenever your cell wants to divide. There is a particular enzyme in your body that copies your DNA. And so we're just gonna actually mimic that. We only need to get a tiny amount of DNA to get a DNA profile. And the way we do this is a process called polymerase chain reaction. 
we are going to take the DNA, we're going to put it into this vat, basically this little cup type thing that we're going to heat up and we're going to add a bunch of extra bases, a bunch of adenines and thymines and uh, guanines and cytosines in there and we're going to throw this enzyme that your body already uses to make copies called DNA polymerase and that DNA polymerase, because it's heated, it doesn't need a lot of activation energy, is literally just going to make copies of your DNA exactly like it would if it was getting ready to divide a cell. So we're using the body's own method in order to make ourselves extra copies of DNA. The more copies of DNA we have, the easier it is going to be to read our results. So we isolate DNA, we amplify it. Next we need to cut the DNA up and here is the key. This is the part that's going to tell us one person from another. We are going to use an enzyme in the body called a restriction enzyme. Now we stole this enzyme from nature. There are several viruses and bacteria that the way they work, the way they infect a cell is by hijacking that cell, injecting their own DNA into the cell, inserting their own DNA into the host DNA, and then making the host cell make parts. So we stole these restriction enzymes from viruses and bacteria that literally are designed by nature to cut our DNA up at specific spots in order to insert their DNA. Now we're not going to insert any other DNA, we're just going to use their chemical scissors or restriction enzymes to cut up the DNA. They're, they're proteins and they basically act like chemical scissors. So since the DNA strands of two different people are going to differ because we have different base pair combinations in the junk DNA, the enzymes are going to cut the DNA at different places. It's going to create um, different lengths of DNA. Imagine I gave three people a hundred feet of rope each and I said, hey, I want you to go cut this rope however many times you want, wherever you want. And then we lined up all the pieces of rope in a line to see who had the longest piece, who had the next longest, next longest, next longest. I would bet that most people won't cut the rope at exactly the same spot every time. And so you, you might have one person that has five pieces of rope cut and another person who might only have three pieces and somebody might have 25 pieces and they're all gonna be different lengths. That's exactly what happens with this DNA because our junk DNA has different base pair combinations. These chemical scissors cut up the DNA into a different number of fragments and the fragments are of different lengths depending on who you are. Here's the one of the most common restriction enzymes that we use is called ECORI and it cuts anytime it sees a GAATTC and that happens to be the same going backwards the other way because DNA when it combines with its uh, complementary pair and it will always cut between the G and the A right there and right there. So we're just cutting up the DNA because individuals have differences in their junk DNA. They will have a different number of fragments and those fragments will be different length. Here's another example. Here's two different people. We are looking for ECORI again G-A-A-T-T-C. It found that site so it cut it right there. This one is a G-A-A-C-T-C. -C. It's a different combination so this particular chemical scissor doesn't cut. So here this person has one large fragment, this person has two smaller fragments. Once we have the DNA all cut up, we're going to put it into a gel and we call this electrophoresis. We put it on a gel and we put an electrical charge on it. Now DNA by its nature has a negative charge and just like magnets opposite attract, we're going to put our DNA next to a negative electrode and we're going to have it go towards the positive electrode. Now I want you to think about when Disneyland used to be open. If you were at Disneyland and you were in a big group of 20 people and you wanted to get from one place to another, but everybody wanted to hold hands, it would take you a long time to get through that crowd because you're this really long chain of people trying to negotiate the crowd. If you're only two people and you want to get 
from one place to another in a really busy Disneyland, you can probably go way faster because there are only two of you. You can slip and slither between all the people much more quickly. And that's what happens with the DNA on this gel. The fragments move from one end of the gel to the other end at different rates, depending on how long the fragment is. And you create a pattern of the bands. How fast and far they move depends 100% on their size. Here's a picture of what the gel looks like. They load the DNA into the well, and then they turn the electricity on, and these, this DNA will move across the uh, gel. We then are going to make a print. We basically transfer our DNA bands onto a membrane with some radioactive probes so we can see it. And you get these banding patterns where each one of these bands represents a fragment of DNA. The farther the DNA has gone from the, from the initial wells, the smaller that piece was. And so we put this x-ray film over it to get a radioactive duplicate of the banding pattern so we can read it. And here is typically what that looks like. Here's where we put the DNA in. So this right here represents the longest piece of DNA. And these ones down here represent the smallest pieces of DNA. Now, these are multiple people. But I can tell that this person right here and this person match up because they have this fragment of DNA, they have this fragment, they have both these two fragments, these two fragments. Every single one of these fragments on these two people match exactly. They have the same number and they are the same length. The only way that that is a possible thing that could have happened is if these people's DNA was identical. Because that eco-RI, remember we are, we're not cutting up a hundred foot piece of rope here. We're cutting up uh, DNA that are millions and millions and millions of base pairs long. And we're looking for every single different individuality that have cropped up over generations inside the junk DNA and it's gonna make those cuts. And those cuts are gonna be different for every single different person. You can see this person right here matches this person right here. Every single fragment of DNA is the same spot. They have the same number and at the same point in the gel. So let me show you how we would do this in forensics. Here's a blood stain that we found at a crime scene. And so what we look for is do any of these people then match this uh, scenario? So they all have this same thing. This is the initial well that we put them in. And we go, oh, well, Bob has this one, but he does not have that. And this one's a little off and he's out. So Bob is out because Bob doesn't have the right uh, banding pattern. Sue, Sue's missing one. She has this one, but not that one. Hopefully you can see pretty quickly that it's John. John has the only DNA profile where every single band matches up. If even one of these is wrong or doesn't match, then it's not John. It has to match exactly. So this method again is called RFLP, Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. It is the original method that we used for DNA profiling. They use this method from when DNA profiling began in 1986, and they used it all the way up until the early 2000s when they made an improvement. And next week we'll talk about that new way that we do it, the current method. But you have to understand this method first in order for that method to make sense. So that's why we started here. I hope you understood. If not, go back and review basic info on DNA and maybe rewatch this. I will talk to you again next week for our very, very last set of forensic science notes.